you know, it, it, it is always something which involves governments, the academia, and, and of course also the companies, especially startups. And, you know, there, there's different companies which are, you know, in different countries. And depending on the, on the, on the uh, rules, you know, it can help you or it can prevent you becoming successful. Great. Talking about sustainability, I will take it back to AI and tell the talents. So the challenges in the talent is not that we don't have youth. We have a lot of youth, at least on this region. But how to get them ready and sustainable and to maintain the turnover for companies. You have been working, I think, with a lot of companies in the ICT sector and supporting them with the talent. So how you can profile these people and what is the challenges on the sustainability for them? I think the sustainability perspective is the growth factor that you can have the money, the idea, the business, and everything set up, and you don't have the talents necessary to make it happen. And this is like from a McKinsey report, they mentioned that the lack of access to the right talents is the major blocker for business growth. So this was marketed as one of the major blockers and there are people who try to solve this problem from different perspectives, like from the upskilling, boot camps, matchmaking events, but we try to view the hiring problem as two human beings trying to meet each other and to view it not just a job description and a, and a CV, it's a profile and the timeline of a person and a portfolio of a company that has a growth plan. So we grasp all this kind of data from both sides and try to do this kind of a very quick matching, matchmaking between both sides. So from sustainability point of view, a company or an ecosystem will not be able to grow with the speed and time to market required without the access to the right talents while the money is there and the opportunity window is opened. And without having the right tools for talents mining, we will, we will keep like doing the MVP and the version one, version two thing, like stage of things. And then we reach a plateau where we don't have the workforce, workforce required to make it happen. So, yeah, that's my two cents. Jumping to the end, and you finished, when I, when I met you first, it was a one, I think, I think one year ago in Saudi Arabia, and we were talking about, we're still in the MVP, we are trying, we are having the license. You are now in, into market. What's the challenges for deep tech startups and for yourself from an MVP till the market? The first challenge we have faced at the beginning is how to convince authorities to get the permissions. Because what currently, how we are flying, we are flying uh, beyond visual line of sight. A lot of authorities are giving visual line of sight permission, but no one got beyond visual line of sight permission. I'm talking about Omani market currently. And this was the biggest challenge, and we successfully obtained the permission. And now we, we've flown for more than 2,000 kilometers of total trips. The second challenge was how to get customers. Okay, especially how to convince the customer, okay, you are coming with a new technology. How, how you will convince them that, okay, this technology will reduce your cost, will increase your efficiency and your effectiveness, will increase your revenue. This is one of the challenges we faced. And the third challenge is, and the most challenge was mindset of people, okay? Especially drone is something new, okay? When you see a drone that is flying on, on your house, it's something weird. We did not get used to this feeling still. So this was one of the challenges. We solved it by doing campaigns to tell people that we are here, we are doing drone deliveries, we are not using cameras. This was one of the biggest challenges we were facing is mindset of people. Okay, great. Moving to the market. Most of you guys are operating on the MENA region in a way or another. And as Joanne mentioned earlier, as we see, there is not a lot of deep tech startups on this region. Do you think geographically this is something positive or negative and how you overcome this part? 
So I, I guess we have a very unique advantage operating in this MENA region. Having a deep tech coming out of this MENA region is something that is not very common, is something that is very promising. We use always to get the deep technology from the outside, from the north, from the west, you know, sometimes from the east, but not from the region. Having the technology coming from the region where you know the problems, where you know the solutions, where you are very close to the deployment, where you can work with the legalization entities, I think it's a very good advantage for us. How you see it, Aya, especially because 60% of this region are used. Is this good part of, or bad part for yourself? I think the challenge with deep tech and such kind of very advanced or emerging technologies from investment point of view is that it's either the proposals or the ideas, the startup ideas people are, and youth coming with are maybe very innovative, but there is no the equivalent business acumen to make it a business case. Or it's an R&D coming from an academic perspective with, and not supported by the business perspective as well. We will come to the investment part. Yeah. I know you have a lot to say. <laughs> so this is a part. And the other part is the awareness of the investment bodies about the impact of such researches and emerging technologies and sponsoring it to create the infrastructure for the economic growth they are searching for. That's number two. And number three is what Ziet mentioned about the laws and the government enabling this to happen and bringing in the infrastructure for it to happen as well. So I believe this is one of the major challenging thing, basically in Africa, when it comes to the infrastructure for such deep tech things to happen. Jorgen, you, you came from Europe to, to start um, something here in the Middle East, and yeah, especially the GCC area. I yeah, would like to know your experience. That's we are all coming from the EMEA region, but I would like to know more why this region is specifically for you. Well, you, you just said it, you know, you have a very young population and it is the young who change the world, not the old one, right? And you probably all have heard about all Europe. That's because the average age in Europe is about 50. Here in the MENA region, it's below 30. And, you know, young people, they want to change the world. They want to improve the world. They want to, you know, grow, found a family. And this kind of mindset, that's what he also mentioned, I think is, is one of your biggest assets you have here. You, you have a very open-minded mindset, a very technology-friendly mindset. You understand the potential, what you can do. And that's why we, we also want, you know, try to become a part of this here. Ziad, you are incorporated in different countries, but your R&D is in Oman. Elaborate. <laughs> you can have, put it in the U.S., in your company in the U.S., or any other branch. If you ask me this question one year ago, it was completely different. But what, what I can see now, uh, we are having a very good opportunities in MENA region, especially now a lot of government and institutes are supporting deep tech technologies. The mindset is becoming different day by day. Very good support deep tech companies are getting. This is what I can see. There is a big move, a big change in a lot of MENA countries right now. So I see that entering to MENA market is a very good idea. And I think there is a good future for MENA market. Great. Going to the investment, and I know uh, for any startup, this is like the untapped taboo. So I will start with AI. We have a success story here. But this success story came after too much failures. I think not few months, maybe a lot of months. So we can start with someone who just raised a good round of investment. Can you tell us the story and advice like our entrepreneurs that starting deep tech? Because... There's always the word of engineers and the word of investment. And I, it's always two islands. So how you connect these islands? OK, so we, uh, we just raised the pre-seed round. It's, uh, it's a small one, but it came after, uh, as I told you earlier, of uh, around 180 rejections from different maybe countries and different VCs, different investors. So it was, yeah, it was quite of a long learning journey. I would call it like this. It was a learning journey. Um, it's, uh, it takes two to tango, as they say. So, yeah, investors, the speakers, it's investors, VCs and private equity funds, they speak a language. And engineers and like people who are dreaming about growth and making something an impact in the world and all of these gold-plated words is, is amazing as well. And to reach it, each other, we, it took me a lot of effort to understand the dynamics of the market, the dynamics of the product and its positioning. 
And the, as I told you, recruitment wasn't an attractive industry at all. It's very boring. Like they are putting money in fintechs, they are putting money in the very obvious things that will guarantee a 100x growth formula for their cash they are going to put in. So whatever I'm going to say, I have to put it and frame it in the nice ways that make sense to them. So for investment, there, are, there is a good money and there is bad money. So there is bad money that the just kind of investors or, people or bodies that spray and pray. They just spray money on every like, good looking idea or like a good looking founder without digging deep. Even they do due diligence, but it is not that they just put the money and deploy it and they just pray it, they make it happen. And there is the good money from people who have a skin in the game. And I was lucky enough to meet like from the, 30, the best 30 minutes in such fundraising exercise, I met our first investors. And after like 25 minutes, he said, you have a beautiful engine. And they said, what? <laughs> like, yeah, this engine is, is, is unique and I want to invest in this. It's it gonna make a huge impact on the recruitment scene. So, and he came in and he started, he saw the, put, the, like the economical potential and he started bring his advisory hat as well, which is like it's money and, advi and that advisory. And we had like a motto on our board that money is everywhere, money is abundant. In, especially in this region, money is abundant, but bad money will, will screw up the company. So if I have like two cents to mention here, it's like to, to be wise enough to always be a learner and a, a student as a company owner or a founder because we don't know it all, no, or even an engineers don't know it all. So there is like the business side of things, there are the investment, the long-term investments and, and all of this side. And there is the part of selecting the right people on board who will really push your company forward, not just uh, bringing in any amount of money. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So going to Hussein, maybe they didn't get an investment round, but they, through a competition, they can get some funding to keep going, so. So let me tell you something. The last event I attended for startups and funding and so on, all messages were positive, except for deep tech companies. No, all the messages was, it's very easy to build a very good business model to get a good investment. If you are deep tech, it's a special case. Let's discuss it later, you know, because it's very <laughs> difficult. So we had several meetings with the VCs at that event. I had like meetings with more than eight VCs. I got a very clear message. So I'm sorry, you are working in a deep technology that we do not understand. We cannot invest in something that we cannot understand. The message for me was very clear. You need to speak their language, the money saving, the production money saving that you will give to them, and then you will get the investment money. So our decision was, we will start, we will kick off by self-funding. We did the self-funding and until today, from you can say 2020 until today, Bright Skies, the mother company, has invested like $2 million to boot up this startup. We got also some research uh, fund from Intel and from Kaust in Saudi Arabia. That's something like 200K, not too much. So it's just giving you some push forward. And then we found this great opportunity of the competition. So Dubai had a great competition. The most important of this competition is that you get in touch with the government. You sign MOU with the government for more, I would say, future production or more future deployment. We got an award of 750K, so it's, it's not an investment, it's a good award. But now we are ready for the first commercial deployment where we can show numbers, where we can show the saving of the operational cost, and then we can go with trust to VCs and for investors. Going to Jorgen because he is always customer-centric. So how is the investment and how you will convince your first customer yeah, that's, that's, that's true. It's, I was at the Museum of the Future yesterday, and I read one sentence which said, okay, we now have the technology and the answer, but where's the question? And this means, you know, is there a demand from a customer side? And then you have to know exactly who is your customer? Who are you actually aiming for? What do you want to change? And, you know, deep tech means that you are going to change something fundamentally. Fundamentally, you are questioning certain things which are considered the way it's, 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 it is, right? And, and if you 
if you have a fundamental change in, in whatever, and, and most of it, it's about people and you know, how they work, how they travel. That's, that's why we are up here, right? And as I said before, you know, transportation is the basis for economic growth. So it's, it's also logic that we are sitting up here somehow, right? And now imagine, you know, and I have been also talking, I think, pretty much about the same amount of people, 180, 200, something like this. And it took me a while to really find out that most of the investors, they do not understand what I was talking about. And, and they do not understand the implications. That's a big problem. So we have to change how we talk so that they actually understand what it's, what it's all about, right? And that's, that's the one thing. And then you were talking about money air and 100x and stuff like this. But if we are talking about deep tech, it is, of course, also about money. But actually, it's not about the money. It's about the mindset, which Sahid said, right? If you, if you really fundamentally change something, then, you know, money will be pouring in. But the benefit to society, the benefit to a country, to a government, to the people living in this country is, is, is beyond only the money. And this is something many investors do not understand or they are not capable of really grasping the full potential. So, you know, you, you have to find some, some, some way to, to communicate the monetary benefits, of course. But in the end, it's about more than only the money because money is only a means. From an engineering point of view, money is only a means to do things. Okay. The idea you, your company have a special case. Tell us more about it. Again, I will go back to mindset and I'll go back to rules and regulations. We met a lot of investors. We found that the most challenge we are facing is that question comes when we tell them that, okay, the drone will fly. The question comes, okay, do you have permission? Okay, we have. If, we, if you want to expand, how you will be getting the permissions? So again, we go back to rules and regulations. So this was the most difficult thing to convince investors to get investment. Okay. A very generic question, but because all the questions all the way was like, we had tried a lot, we have a lot of challenges, a pool of people, the investment. What inspired you guys to complete on this? Like, what's make you every day go to office, I will operate today, I will keep on my dream. So I, I feel it, your life is hard as an entrepreneur and as a deep tech entrepreneur. So I need this inspiration behind this. It, it's definitely not an easy life, for sure, especially if you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know? So I would say the light at the end of the tunnel should be the impact that you believe that you can make to your society. Again, we're working in this region. We believe we can make a major impact. We can make a major change. Just imagine you have this commercial corridor, okay? Just announce it in the G20 meeting. This commercial corridor will go through United Arab Emirates, will go through Saudi Arabia for more than 2,000 kilometers. What if you, you provide self-driving logistic chain that will save something like 20 to 30% of the operational cost and will work 24 hours over seven days per week, driving over 2,000 kilometers in the middle of the desert where there are no cities, where there are no place for the driver to get rest and so on. I think you are making a major impact here. So the impact. Going Aya? I would say definitely it's the impact of making like impact in a lot of people's lives, maybe like years to come you can you meet people like who said yeah we used your platform once and our cha our life changed or we attended this or so this is this is like of the beautiful moments and there is the fun of creating something new like this is the kind of mentality of why not like you have this kind of a crazy idea and you try to make it happen and you start propping around it to find how to build it and and like the more you stay in the problem space and understand your problem very well and like design, like do kind of continuous, like this kind of compound effect that after time you really find this type of tipping point where you create something compelling. And like these kind of moments are very blissful. <laughs> like, yeah, when you just see it working and it's like charm, yeah, this is a blissful moment. And yeah, it's the impact and, and the, 
And, and there is something that we, when you are facing a lot of difficulties, apparently, and your life, like, why I don't just go and get my corporate job back again and just get the cash, like, you know? <laughs> so there is the second thing is that if everyone who has an idea give, give up on it easily. So, yeah, so we won't have such kind of innovations. Uh, yeah. Your inspiration, Jorgen. Why to go to office and why are flying to Dubai to explore and see new markets? Yeah, so, you know, imagine a world where the standard of living, which is extremely high here, the quality of life, you know, you're all, like all big cities are struggling with air quality and all this kind of stuff, right? So there is always a certain stage where the, where the standard of living rises to such a level that you actually are, have a decrease in the quality of life. And this depends on how many resources and energy you consume, right? So everybody is talking about world overpopulation. I do not believe in overpopulation. Eight billion, that's not much. But, you know, each of us is having about 50 energy slaves, which means you have, you're one person in reality, but you have 50 people consuming the same amount what you would consume as a person, you know, living somewhere. So we are not, actually, we are not 8 million people on this planet, but 8 times 50. We are 400 billion on this planet. This is the problem. And what, what we try to do is we try to, do, to reduce the amount of energy slaves needing less resources, less energy, to increase the standard of living and to increase the quality of life at the same time. And this is, you know, with the first, the second, and third industrial revolution, the, the, the higher the prosperity, the higher the resource and energy consumption. And this is, of course, equivalent to carbon dioxide emissions. And if we have technology where we can reduce the amount of resources and energy, but increase the amount of standard of living and the quality of life, this is what, I'm, this is what inspires me, this is what drives me. And this is, you know, you cannot measure this by money alone. You can do. We're talking about trillions. But in the end, it's about the standard of living and the quality of life. I really like this thoughts. I have never heard it. So, yeah, very nice one. Thank you. What inspire you, Ziad? Do what you love. Do what you love. Uh, what inspires me is that uh, drones and AI is my hobby since I was a kid. So whenever I go at work, I'm thinking that, okay, I'm doing what I'm really loving. Of course, with consideration of other things such as you should have a business model, you should have a valid idea, but always do what you love. Whatever challenges you will be facing, it won't be a challenge. It will be a positive challenge you that will lead you to a new things. So this is what... So how you see collaboration could help in deep tech communities. So the word collaboration, maybe it's very tricky, but we found out that startups always collaborate with partners. I know that there is a, a bit of a lack of deep tech resources. Um, so how, how you do this or collaboration with other startups, how you see it? I would say in self-driving, you can never succeed alone. If you have a very intelligent software algorithm, this will never work without a very intelligent sensor on the vehicle. Will never work with a very intelligent controller on the acceleration pedal, on the steering wheel. So we have a very big supply chain that we need to work with to have a very successful product. If you have every project, you have a new supplier, you will never be, you will never be able to have a stable quality of your product. It's very important for us to have partnerships for components, for telecommunication partners, for, I would say, multiple suppliers. This is very crucial for our success. Okay. So, Aya, uh, how you do collaborations? Yeah, it, it, it's like, I, will, I usually view collaboration as this kind of, co like, m multiplied wave lenses, like it gives you... <laughs> Super engineers, yeah. so multiplied wave lenses, yes. Yeah, it gives you an ultimate amplitude. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of a catalyst. It's kind of a it gives you the kind of the the push you want, 
And maybe this is kind of a mindset in the region that people love to live in silos a bit. So like, yeah, everyone is working alone, like this kind of openness and networking and like sharing. People are afraid to share their ideas, to share their data, to share their models, to share their resources. So if we do such kind of collaboration, I believe it's one of the fundamental thing for, for something as a deep tech and AI, basically. Your collaboration, Jorgen, you are flying us to the moon. <laughs> well, yeah. I think collaboration from the very beginning is, is extremely important. Even before we founded the company, you know, we were talking also to the aviation authorities, asking them about their opinion, what we do, and if they would support it. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made sense to, to even start the company. Uh, but of course, you know, we cannot do everything, especially as a startup. So you know, we, need, we need development partners, we need suppliers for all different kinds of components, of course. But one, one example which I would like to mention is we were part of Destination Deep Tech beginning this year at Kaust in, in Saudi Arabia. And there were 10 companies there. And in the beginning, everybody was sitting at the table and telling what they are doing from all different branches, you know, food and energy, cooling, everything. And, and when everybody was sitting there talking about the idea and what their impact would be, you know, I was, I was doing a, a rough calculation if this would be applied worldwide, what did companies do, you know, they would reduce about 70% of the carbon dioxide emissions. You know, 10 companies sitting at one table, roughly 70% carbon dioxide re reduction, right? Because they, they, really, they really would be pushing this. And, and you know, and, and, and the thing is, how do you actually get it to the customer? This is... This is what, what, you know, the, the community, I think, you know, well, yes, you know, some, some of us are more or less pretty much alone. But inside this deep tech community, there is an exchange. But I don't see that many connections to the, to the outside world, so to say, especially also to the financial world, of course, because they're just living on a different planet. And that's very unfortunate. How collaboration help you? To go with well, Talabat. one of the reasons why we are here, right? We are sitting on the stage and presenting ourselves and telling about our, our endeavor. And uh, yeah, probably someone is sitting here or seeing it on a, on a phone or wherever. You know, there is, there is a lot of opportunity. Thank you. Ziad? Uh, I can see that collaboration is very important for any startup to reach their goal fast in your mindset. Sometimes you are doing something maybe that is wrong when you collaborate with someone okay you will notice that why i will do i am doing this why i don't do this so collaboration is very important for success of uh, startups great so we are getting to an end we will open the floor for questions but before this i would like to take a takeaway message from everyone for of you guys supporting to the technology engineers and entrepreneurs who would like to do something in the deep tech? So what's your advice and a takeaway message? So we'll start uh, with Ziad. You would like to start? Uh, my advice is don't let anything to stop you. Uh, always uh, keep into your mind. If the more challenges you face, the more ideas will come up, uh, the more uh, success you will be. Thank you. Jorgen. Well, that's, that's hard, but I would say the most important thing is to have, you know, the right idea at the right time. You can be too early. The right, sorry, the, I didn't the, hear. the right idea, the right idea at the right time. You know, as you see, I'm 55. I've had a lot of ideas and I've, you know, been working in the mobility industry for more than 25 years. And what I've learned in my professional life is, you know, there, there is the right time for every idea because you know, there is nine out of 10 startups who fail. And the question is, why did they fail? Did they have the wrong idea? Usually, no. They were just not at the right time. And so that's, that's very, very important because once you decide to do this, you really have to be absolutely sure that what you believe in also finds a market. That's, that's the most important thing because without the market, without customers, no matter how good the idea, it doesn't really help. And usually, you know, Wait two to three years or something like this, and then probably the world changes. And we are now living in a world which is changing so fast 
that there is so a lot of opportunity. Time. The timing. Yes. It is time right now, yeah. Aya? For, for deep tech and AI, I would say to couple, uh, to take care of the product life cycle and the business life cycle with the R&D and the academic research and the innovation part because we can easily get caught up into research and bringing something new while discarding, delivering something meaningful to the business that makes money and like closing this cycle as soon as possible and like just like it's done is better than perfect because we usually want to perfect things. So just yeah. do it now. Yeah, yeah. Just no, like put the like a cap for R and D where like you have the just enough R and D that can be productized and launched to market as fast as possible. Hossam? Okay, so my advice to entrepreneurs and to startups: first, start with dreaming with the impact you want to make in this world. What will you tell your children later? I have done this, I have done that, I have done that. What's the impact you dream of? Don't run fast for investors. Investors will take you for the highway for deployment, deployment, and revenues. Maybe you need to make your product very well mature first, very well defined first. When it comes to the point when you need to go to investors, you need to believe not in the market, but in the impact. Sometimes the market does not exist today, but you can create the market. So believe in your impact, you can create the market for that. Thank you very much. So we are opening the floor for two questions. So the first question for you all, like the project that you are working on, are you believing it or are you just doing that for money? Like always we're doing businesses for money. So is there like a journey that you believe in something then you get from it money or how is it working with you? It's a very good question. Can I start maybe with the answers? Okay. So maybe, you know, I have other partners. I'm not the only co-founder. I'm the least of them who is interested in money, actually. You know, I'm the technical guy. But my partners are very financial, you know, aware. And actually, without their support, we would have failed a long time ago. Again, as I told you, you cannot find the right investor very early because they, are, they don't understand your technology. Sometimes you need to do some self-funding at the beginning. If you are not financially aware, if you cannot be positive in your revenues, if you cannot cover your expenses, you will fail too early. So money is very important so that you can pass the critical point and then you can make the revenues. I believe if you are developing something that make a big impact, it will come with lots of money, but not too soon. It will take some time. Thank you all for your presentation. Uh, I have just one uh, comment and a question. How do you get uh, talented people to a startup and convince them to go with you in this type of journey and dream? Uh, myself, I find it very difficult. I would like to hear from your side. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think there is, there is three things you can do to attract good people to your startup. F fundamentally, it's the, the challenge they're going to like that present well the challenge you are uh, putting them in and as if it's kind of an overlap of their future with your future. So the more of intersection between the person's aspirations and your company business and business aspirations overlap, the more like he sees himself in your future. So this is number one. He sees like what you are seeing as a visionary person, he must see a part of it for himself as well. So this is number one, because you are still not a well-known company to put in his resume. Number two is the continuous growth and learning and development journey this person will have in your company. So when you take care of their personal development as an individual, they tend to stick more around you because they know that if they go to a bigger company, they might be just messed out like any kind of a normal dude doing something and go home. And third is to work on your employer brand to position yourself as one of the good startups because there are thousands of startups opening and closing every day. So they are taking a risk with you, which entitles the, third, the fourth thing is the perks and benefits and the type of shares and the ESOP that you're offering to them. So you make them feel that they are part of this type of a gamble 
in the end of the game day with them. Hi, thank you for this session. I, I have one question where when it comes to deep tech, for example, let's, let's take Generative AI, which has been ramping for the last, last 12 months. And what platforms do we have in, in Dubai or the market where you, you can bridge the gap between the supply and demand? For example, I, I'm, I'm one of the companies where we have deep expertise in Generative AI, but we are looking for a platform where we can support the companies to develop these technologies. We, so is there anywhere the, the platform is accessible for us to support the demand? So maybe in, here in Dubai, I, I don't know myself, but as IEEE, I can reply to this part. So IEEE Entrepreneurship is aiming next year on 2024 to launch two things. The first thing is a mentorship platform that covers deep tech and non-deep tech also, but tech and tech-enabled startup to connect them with mentors all over the world, okay? So because it's, we have a global presence, so at least you'll find two mentors in each and every country. We are piloting with EMEA region, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. This will be launched in Q1 next year. The other part is that we are working on the deep tech summit series so each and every region we are trying to do this and as Juan mentioned earlier the each region will be tackled as a own region so maybe in the US it wouldn't be on this setup of a panel discussions or awareness it will be matchmaking investors with already startups including the tech transfers in the universities so it different it different from a region to another so the answer here like just follow up the IEEE entrepreneurship and maybe you can find your match in another region. You never know. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the share of knowledge over here. My question is regarding finding good talent in EMEA region. And I want to know about your views regarding having remote teams to supply, the, the, for example, the engineering talent, the product design talent. What do you think about locating remote teams in India and Pakistan where talent is much cheaper considering this region? Okay, so it's the super duper Aya. She's asking about the talents, the pool of talents on the Middle East region. Also the Pakistan and India have a lot of talents and how we can integrate both of them to support the deep tech on the both regions because it's also Pakistan and India are in a way similar to our region in maturity for deep tech startups. So the, it's talent pool. I guess it's, we have now an opportunity window to educate the current talent for workforce we have about the gen tech, gen AI, and the advancements in AI because kind of it's still new and it's easy to build it quickly and have like uh, deep rooted teams and squads who can help accelerating startups to get such component in their in their product because everyone now says that we are we are an AI based blah blah so this kind of AI based a lot of companies already is doing are doing this. But there is a good example we started in Egypt, which we called the Gen AI Meetup and AI for Egypt like movement that we are trying to accelerate and raise the awareness about the latest libraries and pro projects, open source projects where people can just jumpstart from it and accelerate their learning cycle upon it. And I believe we are very similar with the Pakistani market, like in Egypt and Pakistan, we are very close from level of education and the talent distribution. And I believe we need more market insights about the talent distribution so we can really understand the gaps we need to fill because upskilling is done in a very blind, kind of blind way that we just push people towards specific technologies without listening what the market is in need for. So, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure moderating such a great panel with the three great entrepreneurs working on the deep tech on the EMEA region. Thanks to this great panelist and thank you for the audience. We'll have a group photo and then we will go for the next panel. Thank you.